Chapter 7 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Declan McGoran. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 7 turning the tables what's all this mean said thad laughingly although he did not fail to do as he had been ordered two rather rough-looking men came out of the scrub carrying guns which seemed to be handled rather carelessly seeing that they were evidently ready for immediate use I concern an old Pierre there on ye, a pack of boys arter all, and no soldiers, the large man exclaimed, staring hard at the four scouts, some of whom wore various parts of their regular Kakai uniform, as well as the regulation campaign hat of the Boy Scout organisation. Sacre, that is so, the other man exploded, and Thad knew instantly from his name and manner of speech that Pierre must be one of those French-Canadian half-breeds of whom he had heard so much. That's just what we are, my friends, Thad hastened to remark. We belong to a Boy Scout troop in the east, and came out here to have a hunt in the Rockies. Uh, one of our number... A very fat boy wandered off and got lost in the big timber. We were following up his trail and trying to locate him when we discovered a campfire over here. So, you see, we walked another mile just to give our friend a little surprise. But we hope you let us take down our hands now, because it's hard to hold them up like this. The two men exchanged looks. They then lowered the hammers of their guns. The action signified that... According to their way of thinking, they had nothing to fear from these half-grown lads. "'Come and sit down and tell us a lot more,' said the big man with the red face and the crafty eyes. Thad could not bring himself to like because he seemed to see wells of treachery in their depths. So the boys dropped down again, being more foot-weary than ever. But taking a cue from Alan and Thad, the other two scouts kept their guns close beside them. Apparently none of them exactly liked the looks of the two strangers, and they were not accustomed to much reading of character either. "'What is name Bumpus?' asked the American. Just what it was, flashed out Giraffe. But how did you know that? Have you met up with our last pard? Sure ain't I got ears and didn't want you call out that same name when yous was a going to walk into our camp, demanded the other gruffly. Tad was on the alert. He did not feel favourably impressed by the looks of the two men. Besides, he noticed a crafty, greedy expression cross their faces whenever they allowed their eyes to rest on Step Hen's new repeating rifle. Evidently, the neatness of the little weapon quite captured them and made them envy the boy its possession. And Thad was of the opinion that two such rough-looking customers would not hesitate long about trying to obtain anything they coveted. The conversation soon became more general, the men wanting to know how it was these boys, almost wholly inexperienced in the ways of the woods as they took them to be, were venturesome enough to start into the foothills of the Rockies without a single guide along. So Tad explained how they had engaged a pair of guides, both of whom had disappointed them, one by getting sick, and the other in taking up with a couple of bighorn sportsmen. But we heard of a man up here somewhere, Tad went on, who'd been logger, trapper, timber cruiser and everything, and people said that if we could only run across Toby Smathers, and he took the job, we'd have a guide worth any two men. 
What's that? Toby Smathers, did you say? Demanded the other, that crafty look coming into his face again. Yes, that was the name. Do you happen to know him? Asked Giraffe eagerly. Reckons now, as none of ye ever run across Toby, are that right? Asked the man. We never have, replied Thad. The fellow laughed harshly. It sure is a fact, he went on to say. Just think of it, Per Laporte, they's asking a me if I ever run across Toby Smathers. Ain't that a good joke, though? I've carried a few names in my day. Yonkers and Toby Smathers be one of them. Oh, then you're the very man we've been looking for, eh? But while Tad uttered this sentiment, there did not seem to be any great amount of enthusiasm in his manner, Alan thought. He believes the fellow lies, and I just know it, Alan was saying to himself. And if so be you want to make an offer, spot cash to guide you boys through the big timber, find your missing chum, and show you some big horn hunting in the Rockies, I'm your man. Only make the price with my while and cash down, spot cash. Tad said he had no doubt it could easily be arranged to the satisfaction of all parties concerned. His object was really to gain time. He had received a secret sign from Alan, which told him just as plainly as so many words would have done that his chum had something of importance to communicate as soon as they could get their heads together. Step Hen and Giraffe had apparently swallowed the story offered by the self-called Toby Smathers without a suspicion. They were now entertaining the two men with some accounts of previous experiences. The fellows seemed to be in high spirits, and they would nudge each other and laugh boisterously on the slightest pretense. And sometimes they would laugh when there was no humorous story being told. A look exchanged between them being sufficient grounds for hilarity. Sure enough, they're feeling pretty fine, thought Tad, and it strikes me they think they've got a little joke of their own that they're playing on us. Three to one, it's about the name. Two, I just can't believe that man answers to the description I've had of Toby Smathers. Why, they said he was just a picture of an honest woods ranger employed by the government to watch out for timber thieves, forest fires and the likes. And that man's face would condemn him on sight before any judge. Just then he heard Alan say he was thirsty and must get a drink. The stream ran nearby and Thad noticed how the cautious Maine boy carried his gun along with him as he went. A minute or so later, Tad also arose. Oh, I'm as dry as a bone, he observed. And I think I'd like a drink about the size of the one Alan's getting. Wait here, fellows. He added these last words as a sop to quiet the suspicions of Pierre and the man who called himself Toby Smathers. They had frowned and made an impatient movement upon noticing that Tad Thu took his gun along with him. Rather a queer thing to do when only going for a drink. But Thad's last words apparently served to disarm their suspicions. They had two of the boys held as hostages at any rate. Thad found his chum much excited. A drink just then was about the last thing Alan Hollister was thinking about. What is it? asked Thad in a whisper. Let's laugh a little out loud so they won't be suspicious, said the other. And after that clever dodge had been carried out, he went on to add, You didn't believe what he said about the, that name, did you, Thad? Ha, ha, ha. I certainly don't believe he's the man we're looking for here, came the answer. That's right, Alan went on, and I know he's a fraud. He wants to get hold of anything we have that worth, that's worth taking. Uh, that gun of step hens seems to just take his eye. Do you know who he is? demanded Thad. I can give a pretty close guess. And now that we heard the name of his companion, Pierre Laporte, said Alan, some men down at the post where we got the mules told me to look out for a half-breed by that name who kept company with an even worse scoundrel named Hank Dodge. And this is Hank, all right. Make up your mind to that, Thad. Rascal is written big all over his face, I can see, the other went on. 
But what is their line? Just plain scamps or timber cruisers? There are different kinds of timber scouts or cruisers, they tell me, Alan continued. Some are honest men, working for honest lumber dealers. Others spy out rich tracts on government land, which the big company of thieves they're hired by want to cut next winter. The government loses millions on millions every year that way, and these crafty fellows are up here looking for timber that can be easily stolen and marketed next winter. What had we better do? asked Thad. It wouldn't be safe for us to spend the night in camp with them. No, I should say not, replied Alan earnestly. If we go in the ordinary way, the chances are they'll jump on us. So, I suppose, we might as well up and tell them we know who they are, and that we don't propose staying any longer in their company. But they'd be as mad as hornets, suggested Thad. Let them, replied the other. Four guns are better than two, any day. Come on back to the fire right away. As they drew near, Alan whispered, He's got it right now. Step Hen's rifle, I mean. Reckon he asked to see it, and our chum handed it over. Uh, chances are he won't give it back again in a hurry. There, what did I tell you? He's laid it down beside him, Thad. Now's our time to cut in, then, said the patrol leader. You watch out for Pierre, and don't let him slip up on you, or there'll be heaps of trouble. Cover him when I do the other. Ready? Then here goes. And ten seconds later, those by the fire heard Thad call out in ringing tones, It's your turn, Pierre and Hank Dodge, to hold up your hands. Quick now, or it'll be the worse for you. The tables are turned. Up with them! End of chapter 7. Uh, recording by Declan McGoran.